Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Sonia Kennebec, who is a documentary film director, and also Innes Hoffman Kenna, who is a producer uh, on documentary films and has been working on Reality Winner, the documentary. And they're here, both of them are here to discuss uh, the effort to complete a Kickstarter campaign and to finish the final stages of production of this documentary on NSA whistleblower reality winner. So welcome. Thank Thanks you. so much for having us. And uh, let's, let's begin here by uh, this, the basics here. Um, either of you can take this if you want, but you're working on completing production on this film that uh, has uh, been in development and you've been doing a lot of work with it and taking a, a, a version of it around to festivals for uh, a, a few festivals. Uh, but now, uh, because Reality Winner is no longer in prison, you've had this opportunity to uh, talk with her, uh, get her involved in the movie, show her and, and what she's doing post-life and pr uh, the, the time that she was in prison after this case. And so tell people about you know what you're you're trying to uh, do with the film now, and you know yeah where where you plan to see this project go next. Should I I can start. Um, so like you, we have been following Reality Winners' case from the very beginning because um, whistleblowers, national security whistleblowers, are so incredibly rare, and when Reality was first um, or her arrest was first announced. I remember Ines and I were talking about it immediately. And um, Ines actually said to me pretty early on that I should fly to Georgia and I should, you know, attend one of the pretrial hearings and, and meet her mom and just, you know, find out more about the case and, and witness it. And that's how, how we got started. Um, we went to um, one of the pretrial hearings and, and realized how little coverage there was of her case by, you know, mainstream national um, journalists and, and, and media. I, I had expected, considering how, you know, election security was such a big topic at that time that there would be, you know, tons of TV crews and so on, but that wasn't the case. And that's why we decided to independently cover uh, reality's case. And so, yeah, we've been on this for many, many years, um, you know, around five years. And we have, um, you know, we, we had followed... Uh, Billy Reality's mom um, for many years because we couldn't get you know direct access to Reality because uh, she was you know in in jail the entire you know pretrial detention and like, she was in pretrial detention and then she was you know put in prison um, so she really was an absent character initially in our film but then she was released from prison and we were actually able to be there. Um, you know, and, and you know, film her reunion with her family and her sister. And I was also able to do her first interview. And it was just, you know, incredible. And so we decided that we really want to give reality the opportunity now. And that's what this Kickstarter is for, to, you know, raise the finishing funds to tell her own story. So the, this film now, the reality winner film, is really told in a centering um, reality winner's perspective. And we're really hoping that um, we can, um, you know, do multiple things with the film. We really do want to um, showcase this very, very specific Espionage Act case. We really want to explain to people what the Espionage Act is. We have other uh, whistleblowers in the film. Edward Snowden uh, gave an amazing interview. We have uh, Thomas Drake. We have, uh, you know, John Kiriakou. We have really the who's who who had to um, deal with this um, uh, law. And we really want to explain to people what it means and, uh, you know, what what, um, you know, what has been happening to those people. Ironically, uh, now Trump himself is being investigated under this very law. 
Um, that's the one he used against reality. And in this very ironic real life twist, now he's being investigated on it. And reality herself, actually, in a recent interview, said that um, she doesn't even wish this on uh, Trump. Um, so we really want to talk about that in the film. We do want to showcase the whole um, uh, case. Um, we will, you know, um, show because we filmed from the beginning um, the trajectory that Billy had, uh, reality's mom, uh, how really she became um, an activist. She was very much, um, you know, inspired to, um, you know, speak out and fight for her daughter very publicly, which not many people do. Um, so it's her story. But now again, like Sonia said, we have this amazing opportunity to now center everything around reality who was absent before and now is able to uh, talk about this um, and just hopefully really um, hit many the topics, um, you know, and also make a really good film. Because we do feel that um, unlike maybe a, a written piece or a, a news reportage or like TV reportage, um, a, a documentary film, a cinematic piece, um, can really hit people in different ways, emotionally a little bit, so that maybe these individual stories stick with them and people begin to see the bigger picture. Yeah, that's that's right. And I, I agree with you that you, uh, just a one-on-one -on -one interview with reality winner might not necessarily convey all the issues. Like if we're thinking of like the 60 Minutes interview gave a lot of exposure to reality winner's story, but seeing it presented and then also getting that other aspect, which is that she had parents who were supportive of her and she had a parent who became an advocate and was out there and became pretty knowledgeable about the yes. issues under the Espionage Act and could speak about this on panels. I have been uh, on, on panels with Billy Winter Davis. Um, we actually did an event at University of Michigan before the pandemic shut everything down. And she is someone who... Uh, is very impressive to me um, and is, is as inspiring as Reality Winner has been inspiring to me to watch. So you were able to make your goal of $60,000 on Kickstarter to get the, uh, the the initial set of funds that you wanted. And now you have those stretch goals. Uh, we can talk about the, the different things you want to do if you're able to meet those stretch goals. But first, I have the uh, clip queued up for people so for those who have never seen any clips from this film or maybe want to get a better sense of what you're trying to do with the documentary i'd like to play this uh two two and a half minutes that you have this kind of a uh would you call it a trailer is a it a trailer a teaser. a teaser okay if you were to go into a time machine to may 2017 and turn on any news media, any channel, there was one question mark hanging in the air. And that one question mark was holding the entire country back. And I thought with a couple pieces of paper, I could bring an end to that crisis. And that's how we got here. Reality Winner leaked a secret report on Russian election hacking to the media and will now serve more than five years in prison. That's the longest sentence ever imposed for this kind of violation. June 3rd started as a wonderful day. I drove up to my house. I had a car full of groceries. And soon as I had closed the door and gone around to the back of the car, this unmarked black SUV came up and... Well, the reason we're here today is that we have a search warrant for your house. Okay. All right. Uh, do you know what this might be about? I have no idea. Okay. This is about uh, possible mishandling classified information. Is that here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We obviously know a lot more than, than what we're telling you at this point. And I think you know a lot more than what you're telling us at this point. I didn't realize that it was about to become a four hour chess game for my life. All right, so that's the clip of the reality winner documentary, the teaser that you put together for the film. I uh, know. Um, Either you, Innes, or Sonia, 
can you tell people about the stretch goals and what your plans are for the the film if you're able to you know, reach these different goals? Yes, do you? Uh, sure. Um, yes. So basically, um, the um, amount of money we just raised, and thanks to everybody who supported us, it was an amazing, like immediate and immense re response, which we didn't expect. Um, that was literally just the basics for the rest of the edit, a lot of technical stuff that's very, very boring, but that costs a lot of money, color grading, sound design, all this stuff. But now um, with um, each... Um, with each individual extra 5K or 10K, now we can start building the actual rollout. So instead of just saying, okay, let's uh, at least put the film in the theater in New York or maybe on the West Coast, maybe we can add a city. We definitely finally can um, uh, um, pay all the travel um, uh, expenses for uh, Billy, Reality, Gary, like the whole family, if they want to come to a screening. Um, we could do... Um, you know, we could hire um, a real amazing publicist to help us with this, because as you know, some press is so important uh, for stuff like that, uh, especially for independence, right? So we can do many more things with each extra step. So what we raised so far was the absolute necessary amount of money to finish the film. And now we can go a little bit further and do a little bit more. Fundraising is extremely difficult in uh, independent documentary making. So this has been just amazing. Um, I have to say, I was very worried about a Kickstarter campaign. This is our first Kickstarter campaign. We've never done this before. So this has been uh, amazing, an amazing response. Just just wonderful to see how people come, come and support you. Yeah, and if yeah. I can just, oh, sorry. I, you know, we, we really did a lot of research and preparation um, ahead of it because, you know, <laughs> it is, it's, it's nerve wracking and it's, you know, it does require a lot of, um, yeah, you know, professional preparation to really communicate um, what we are doing here, why we're doing it, you know, the, the teaser, um, you know, we had to put that together, especially for, for this campaign because we, we didn't have it. But then on the other side, on a positive side, but I think what this Kickstarter does and, and the crowdfunding campaign is really involving people into the artistic process and the, the process of you know, filmmaking and journalism. And it's, it, you know, the response really has been so incredible. So many um, supporters have been sending us you know, positive messaging and encouraging messaging and really want to be part of, of this campaign and want to support us. And um, you know, what, what, what I think is so important about you know, independent um, journalism um, and independent documentary is that we often um, cover original stories and stories that otherwise would you know, not be widely known and um, or would be told in the case of reality winner you talked about you know the interviews that that she has been giving um that now we're coming out you know after the fact after she has been released but what the difference is about our work and also your work is that we were there when it happened um you know we were we were there when we didn't know the outcome we didn't know that she would be detained for her entire pretrial period which was over a year that um she would get the longest sentence a whistleblower ever received in federal court and you know this this is a high risk you know to cover a story like that but on you know the like the importance of it is that it is documented now mm -hmm. that you can actually see what happened when it happened. And if we weren't there with a the camera, you know, this, it wouldn't exist. So it is really something that exists now and it's there for the historical record for people to analyze. Um, you know, some people wouldn't believe that she would, you know, that she was treated so harshly. I think if you and us, you know, if we weren't there and um, and really witnessed and captured it um, during the time when it happened. And another thing that we're really, really proud of and um, uh, was just shown in the teaser, just a little bit of it, um, is that um, 
and you know a lot about this. Um, we, you know, send out FOIA requests all the time. We make these requests all the time. And uh, very often lots of time goes by. And sometimes you do not get what you're asking for. And this was the case in this case, right? So the uh, transcript of this interrogation existed and was used in court. So we knew about it. But what we really, really wanted is the recording for it which is a very unusual thing to begin with because apparently the FBI does not record these uh, interrogations, but there is one for this one. So we filed a FOIA request and just really would not, we would not get this file. Um, and big shout out to our pro bono lawyers at the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press because they helped us. Um, we filed a lawsuit. We had to sue the FBI to release this audio to us. And we did receive it. It took some time and lots of effort. And again, this amazing pro bono help um, but we got the audio and it's now in the film. We will hear, the audience will hear how these agents operate, how they communicate, what they say and how they say it. And it's incredible. It's incredible. Um, and we just really, um, you know, hope that um, people will, um, you know, uh, take away from that, like, um, you know, these systems that we usually don't have access to. And so there is a little bit of a coup in the film as well, a journalistic coup, like to get something like that, to get this material, you know, um, and I know you can appreciate that because you do, you work in that same space and you know how difficult it is to get these, um, you know, original source materials. It's incredibly difficult to get those in in a timely manner and when you actually want them for the project that you are producing. And the other point I think is worth making very quickly here is that reality winner and the support she has is much, much more substantial today than it was when she came forward as uh, a person who was known to have released this document, when who was known to be um, a whistleblower who was... Uh, introduced to people through the intercepts reporting of of the document, and uh, when we you know we first saw her and she was in the orange jumpsuit and in jail, and uh, there weren't a lot of people who were I'll, I'll I'll call them liberals or Democrats who were that supportive. Now she's got pretty strong support, and the reason being was I think they were really extremely reluctant to support somebody who had broke the rules and given a document to journalists when you're not supposed to do that. So even though they wanted to see Donald Trump held accountable for things related to, you know, anything that could be confirmed related to uh, trying to uh, interfere in the election or uh, you know, any collusion with Russia or whatever. There was all kinds of media coverage of that back then, and it still didn't make a difference. They weren't very supportive. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that they've done that I'm really glad that your documentary does differently, which is to say that 60 Minutes or MSNBC shows or any anywhere else for the most part has done this thing where they kind of pit reality winner against edward snowden and edward snowden is actually in your documentary so there's no like reality winners the good whistleblower and edward snowden's the bad whistleblower but i also in my in in, in me saying this i'm not really trying to draw us into a conversation about these different cases as much as to say that the thing that's really great about reality winner and her mother is that they know how to navigate these spaces without being drawn into these conflicts that are going to make it difficult for you to have the most and widest amount of support possible in order to show people that you should never have been put under a microscope and prosecuted like this in the first place. But, you know, to be honest, there is really a tendency um, in a lot of people, there, there's so much black and white thinking. Um, there is no allowance for people to be complex <laughs> and to have different sides to them. And um, that one person can within herself can contradict herself, you know, and that, that's just missing from the conversation most of the time. There is no pitting whistleblower against whistleblower. That's not the whole point of this at all. The whole point is we have to talk about whistleblowing and why it is necessary to begin with. Why are these people compelled to come forward and release certain things? And again, this is not a this is a rare occasion, especially in the national security space. This doesn't happen every week, okay? But those people who do that 
they are compelled for very important reasons. And it's upon us to listen to those things, right? We talk so much, we get hung up on the person behind it, but let's look at what they're releasing and why. And unfortunately, the Espionage Act shuts down that conversation because now we are not allowed to know anything, right? And that should be questioned, not the person and their motivation. Like, let's just please look at the laws we are employing here and what happens to these people and what an effect that has, a chilling effect, a chilling effect on people, you know? So that's kind of like our motivation as filmmakers as well. Yes, there's individual cases that we want to follow, but there's a bigger problem, a bigger elephant in the room than that. Yeah. And don't you think, you know, Kevin, I'm, you know, wondering also what, what your thoughts are about this. Like, you know, you, you have followed this case from the beginning. And initially, as you said, there was so little media coverage. Like it, it, it was extraordinary how little media coverage her case, you know, like, um, you know, drew because it was about one of the themes that was discussed in the media, you know, so much like, you know, foreign election interference and so on. And then the content of her disclosure um, was also, you know, the subject of, of hearings and, you know, led to, you know, the election officials said that they knew nothing about it. So it actually led to reforms. Meanwhile, at the exact same time, the person who disclosed the information was in, in jail, in pretrial de detention, facing, you know, 10 years in prison for one single document. The Intercept published five pages. And there was so little coverage until now, you know, the last maybe two years or so. This became big. But I, you know, I've been like wondering, like, why, why do, you know, these huge media outlets, why do they only cover these cases when they are over it, you know why why are they not doing it when it actually you know would really really have an impact for the families for the people most impacted yeah i just don't think they're interested in and we have to call it what it is source protection because reality winner was a media source she gave the document to a media organization and uh, they they don't they don't do this for people who are prosecuted i don't know if it's because of uh, and this probably is a dynamic that exists with the espionage act and you know the way that they talk about this journalists talk about the espionage act in terms of how they're off limits because it's supposed to stop with the government employee or the contractor who works for the security agency. But then, and then that means that I, uh, I'll just use myself as an example, being a journalist, I can take a document from someone like reality winner and I don't have to worry about prosecution or so we're led to believe right now, but there is the case of Julian Assange that might upend that entirely. But the dynamic is supposed to be, that uh, especially since uh, Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers and uh, some of these other cases and the kind of formal understanding, which is not written in any law, but it's between the Justice Department and all of these journalists and their editors and some of the press freedom groups, the understanding is that you're not going to come after me and prosecute me for publishing classified information and, and accuse me of violating the espionage act and so i think they don't want to be so supportive of the media source that then they can be accused of being a conspirator so i think they might be getting advice from their law departments at these institutions that say you know be careful how you appear to support this but i just think that that's really shooting yourself in the foot uh, because, yeah, and it's also yeah. a story is a story is a story, right? Yeah. Like that's what I, you know, wonder about is that it's, you know, it doesn't have to, you know, mean that you're, you know, supporting strongly, even though I do think that journalists should, you know, be invested in source protection and um, and, and and really, you know, particularly whistleblower protection because we rely on whistleblowers in our reporting. However, you know, Ines and I, and, you know, I think you as well, we, we, we do, we come from a very journalistic perspective. So, 
you can and you should cover these stories as they happen because there's such a value in bearing witness, I think, and being there and showing what's happening and not just, you know, because if you do it four or five years later, you know, it's, you, you can only report on a certain aspect of a story, but a lot of the other, you know, stuff that, you know, has happened is, is past. Like you, you, you don't, you know, you, you can't witness like how, you know, reality was really, you know, so closely protected, how her family was being warned not to um, communicate with her in, in court. She was afraid to, to turn around and even look at them. So mm-hmm. there, there was this whole atmosphere of um, fear, which y- you couldn't report about if you weren't there and witnessed it and heard it yeah. and saw it, right? It's just tragic to me that um, it's on the shoulders of independent journalists and independent documentary filmmakers to report these cases in their, you know, real, in their, in their, the full story, right? That that is upon us um, to take those risks. We, we just, we, we are independents. We don't have uh, a network to back us, a ton of lawyers. We don't have that and we still take the risks. So it's really hard to understand why you know, a more mainstream outlet couldn't take a tiny little bit, you know, maybe they can take our type of risk, but they can take a little bit more of a risk. And then the question is, do they just not want to report it because there's, you know, political ramifications for them? Or like, what is it that um, hinders them from um, then discussing the fact, for instance, that a reality winner was shut up, she was put away, no one had access to her. We tried again and again uh, to get an interview to talk to her, to be able to talk to her. So did some other outlets as well. But it was just impossible to get to her. That fact alone is just that is worth reporting also. Like what is happening here, right? What are you doing to this woman specifically in this case? And I feel like that's just not, that hasn't happened. And then if we wouldn't have doc- documented this, uh, it would be lost to history. Absolutely right. So just but before we end our, our conversation here and encourage people to go give to this Kickstarter campaign, uh, I want to ask you to say a little bit about you know the struggle that you've had securing distribution just so people can appreciate the work that you really have to you know try and get through as an independent filmmaker and and how, uh, you know, this this version is going to be a better version. I'm confident it'll be a way better version than the one that you had before, especially since you get to talk to reality and include her in the film. But uh, I mean, the the struggle you had before she was out of prison. Tell us a little bit about that. So I, I can start and maybe you can continue, Ines. Um, you know, just like to, to, to talk about sort of differences between, um, you know, documenting the story without, you know, with the limited access we had to reality at first because she was locked away and access to it was so restricted. I, I did a phone interview, but of course, over a monitored phone line, we had to be so careful and I definitely did not want to, you know, get her in any trouble. So, and we knew that she was being actively monitored. So we had to be extremely cautious. Um, However, we are very, very proud of, you know, still doing the film with all these restrictions because they did like the, the, the thing that was so, Um, mind-blowing and so harsh about this case is that she was locked away she was you know she she was really struggling as we will learn through her own you know interview in 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 our new film but she she was struggling immensely in in jail and also in in prison and we still managed to you know through her mom you know her being an absent character to capture what had happened because that is important. It is important to show and um, and bear witness and also you know publish when someone is silenced. Uh, you know that should not lead to you know a lack of reporting. However, 
um, what you know we we've been doing now is that um, in we premiered um, a version and at, at South by Southwest in 2021, shortly after reality was released early from prison. And we had the opportunity as the only film team to be there. So we filmed, you know, her reuniting with the family. Um, when she was ready for it, we did the first interview with her. Um, it really was so revealing to, you know, speak to her for, you know, the, the first time without being monitored and, and hearing, you know, like her side of the story and her testimony. And that's why we decided to, you know, this, this film that will come out next year is, you know, her story, you know, told from all of the different perspectives, including her own perspective. And then as far as the, the distribution goes, I mean, that's a whole different subject and podcast and, you know, uh, conversation uh, because so much is going on in our industry right now. Um, there's so much consolidation and, you know, the buyers are merging and, you know, it, it, there's a lot going on. And the pandemic, of course, it did not help independent filmmakers with distribution either. So um, it's been incredibly difficult, but it's kind of in the vein of what has happened with the story. It apparently is not a mainstream story. <laughs> so therefore, mainstream distributors also pass on that. Mm. But we are embracing this independence at this point. We are saying, okay, we are independent journalists and independent filmmakers. Let us be our own independent uh, you know, distributors and get this film out the way we would like to do it and work with independent theaters, for instance, um, and yeah. independent distributors. So we, we are embracing this. I mean, this apparently is our role <laughs> and this is the perfect film to do it with. So um, that's where we're at. We, we're not going to let um, the industry stop us from releasing the film. So we'll, we'll go ahead and hopefully um, in 2023, you can see it somewhere near you on some streaming platforms as well. And, uh, you know, hopefully you'll um, really like this, um, this film. So the last thing I want to say is that it is remarkable, too, because seeing reality, you're going to get to show people that the prosecution does not end in the courtroom, and it certainly does not end in prison. It continues even after she is released from prison. Um, you, you talk to her. She's living under these very onerous restrictions from the probation officer, uh, only recently was she allowed to travel outside of this judicial district to go see family. I was really stunned that they were, were that she was allowed to go to North Carolina on the Thanksgiving holiday weekend to see family uh, before she had posted about how she had been denied that opportunity to go see her sister. And uh, so this is something that will be remarkable for everyone and they should appreciate how this continues you know because you know this isn't unique to reality there's anybody who's um a, a convicted convicted of a felony has to go through this but she can't vote and there's other things that a, a typical person takes for granted that you can't do and that continues in reality's life which, yeah. by the way, is one other point we wanted to make with the film is really we are hoping that um, by getting this film out, um, you know, this reality story is not over. We really do uh, hope that um, people help with um, maybe writing uh, to the powers that be about uh, a pardon for her, right? Yeah. To have this struck from, to realize what the story actually was and to have this struck from her record so that she uh, can live life to the fullest from, from here on out, right? That is still hanging over her and maybe the film will make a, a contribution towards that. Yeah, and, and just I hope in general, the, sorry, just in general, seeing the conditions, right? It's, it's, you know, as you said, it is not just reality who have been, you know, there are so many people in these situations and that's what's been so remarkable about reality herself is that she has, you know, through her experience, has you know is, is has been become really outspoken for um you know people who are in detention you know it's is you know has reported about what she has been witnessing herself she she wants to be actively involved in in you know communicating her experiences and it's really i think it's crucial for people to know so when they see the story you know it does educate 
about so many other things. And, you know, I'm absolutely convinced this, this film, our work, you know, it has a wide audience. People want to see political stories. I think people want to see human stories. And it's, you know, the audience is there. And this Kickstarter is actually proving it, I think, you know, that the people really are interested in seeing original, important political work. All right. Well, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Ennis. I wish you the best with completing all the post-production and securing distribution and being able to do whatever you want. I mean, films go on journeys. Independent filmmakers don't have executive producers with deep pockets or executives that are working there who have these massive amount of funds in order to support uh, films. They don't have the access to all the different theater chains or the top streaming services so that people can get the films. So you had to really work hard and you hang on everything. And when you complete goals like you did with that $60,000 with uh, Kickstarter, it's a, it's a big deal. So I'm just going to show people again that if you go to uh, this, um, if you go to Kickstarter, if you find reality winner the documentary uh this shows you where you are you have 412 backers right now um you've you've got the stretch goals you're pushing out to 90,000 and you're at 62,516 right now as we record the interview recording this on a Friday December 9th um and so now you've got a little less than a month to push onward and get this and if you meet those goals then you get all the funds. Do you get all the 60,000 no matter what? Cause you're doing this as a stretch. So Kickstarter is going to give you all of the 60, no matter yes. what. Yeah. 60 minus fees. <laughs> right, well, yeah. Just, Kickstarter is going to take a cut. You yes. have to unfortunately pay the platform. So, all right, I'm going to take this down. And then uh, again, thank you very much. It was good to speak with both of you. Thank, thank you very you. much.